You will be aware that this is, the, this is Darwin year, the bicentennial of Charles Darwin's birth, and the sesquicentennial of publication of The Origin of Species. And timed for this year, you will also know that an extremely significant and important book has appeared on the evidence for evolution. That book is, of course, Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne, who is our next speaker. Uh, professor of Genetics in the University of Chicago. Uh, I have come to regard him since the death, the, the sad death of John Maynard Smith as the principal guru to go to on evolutionary genetics in the world. And it's a very great pleasure to introduce Jerry Coyne to speak today. Thanks, Richard. It's an honor to be invited here by Richard and also by the AAI and to have so many people interested in not only my talk, but talks about science. Uh, my purview here is to talk about um, the theme of the conference, which is Darwinism, in particular, as Richard said. Um, the evidence, oh, can you not hear me? I, the mic's up about, is, oh, is that better? Okay. Sorry, it's sliding down my freshly starched shirt. Um, the, the Evidence for Evolution, of course, there's another book out, which Richard was too humble to mention, but you'll hear about it later, The Greatest Show on Earth. And we cover overlapping, but fortunately um, not too overlapping areas of biology. Anyway, when I heard from Richard, I got a letter um, telling me what he would like to see me talk about. He asked me to put a positive approach to the beauties of the world of science in the talk. And I presume this is in reaction to the sort of negative image that we atheist scientists have amongst the public. We're always nattering on about horrible creationists, and, and we're always trying to take people's religion away from them. And so I want to give a sort of positive aspect to evolutionary biology and make it palatable to people. And that's what I'm going to do today by way of presenting what the evidence for evolution really is. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to bash creationism very much. PZ did a really good job of that, PZ Myers, yesterday. I'm going to talk pretty much about what the evidence for evolution is. But I have to cast this in the context because you're not going to see anybody up here giving a talks about the evidence for atoms or the evidence for pathogenic bacteria, stuff that was accepted 100 years ago like evolution was 150 years ago. Why am I bothering to get up here and talk about stuff that we already knew was true a century and a half ago? And the reason is this, particularly in the United States, that the acceptance of the evolutionary biology is far less than the acceptance of the existence of atoms or pathogenic bacteria. If you line up, say, 34 technologically advanced countries, in terms of their acceptance of evolution, each country is on the left, running down, I think, from Iceland to the bottom. Um, and look at the percentage of people that accept evolution, which is in blue, not so sure, in um, tan, and false in red. You'll see the countries line up, and here's where the United States is. We're 33rd out of 34th countries, just above Turkey, which is somewhat of a fundamentalist Islamic country, and right below Cyprus. So this is a pretty abysmal position for us to be in, given that we're, at least we think of ourselves, as a technologically advanced society. Okay, why is this? Why are we so advanced? We just heard a great lecture on stem cell research, a lot of it in this country. Why so low in evolution? Well, I think you know the answer to that, but I'll defer that bashing to the end of the talk. Um, one clue might be that because we're always fighting a rear guard action against evolution because of people trying to keep it out of the schools, and most of those people, as was true in the Dover trial in 2005, are motivated by religious motives. Okay. That's all the creation bashing for now. What I want to talk about is a lot of stuff that's limbed in my book, Why Evolution is True. I understand it's on purchase outside, although I haven't seen it. And I'm going to tell you what the evidence for evolution is. But before I do that, I have to tell you what scientists mean by when they say something is true. And when we say the theory of evolution is true, what do we mean by a theory? And what do we mean by the theory of evolution? And then I want to present the evidence for why that theory is true in a scientific sense. And I'm doing this for several reasons. I don't think I need to convince people in this audience that evolution is true. You wouldn't be here otherwise. 
But perhaps you don't have the armamentarium of evidence under your belts to talk to your neighbors or your relatives about why it's true. The second reason is that maybe you don't realize how multifarious this evidence really is. It's not just the fossil record. It comes from six or seven different areas of biology, all of them confluent in this truth of the hypothesis that Darwin proposed 150 years ago. And finally, the evidence for evolution is just really cool stuff. It's interesting, it's amazing, it's astounding, it's staggering. And that's what my book is about, that's what Richard's book is about. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk. First of all, I have to get clear what we mean by a scientific fact. What do we mean when we say that something is true scientifically? We don't mean true beyond all possible doubt in the absolute truth sense. We mean, and I believe this definition was first raised by Stephen Jay Gould, it's an assertion for which there is so much evidence that it would be perverse to deny it. And by that, I mean that those people who are capable of judging the evidence, if almost all of them say that that's true, then it's true, and that's what we mean in science. So when I say something in science is true, it's like this desk is true. There may be some philosophers out there that say, well, just because I can knock on this and make a sound doesn't mean that this thing is really there, but the vast majority of you would agree that this desk is there, and I'm sitting, standing behind a lectern, and I will try to propose that there's as much evidence for evolution as there is for the fact that this lectern is here before you. Okay, and so that kind of evidence is true for atoms. You'd have to be perverted to deny that atoms were the constituents of elements. Um, there are some people out there undoubtedly who don't, but who do deny it, but they're a minority. Same with pathogenic bacteria. And the evolution falls in that class as well. I will maintain that evolution is just as true in the sense I mentioned as are the existence of atoms as the constituents of elements and pathogenic bacteria for causing disease like strep throat and gonorrhea, okay? Now, evolution is a theory. It's called a theory, but it's a theory in the scientific sense in which it's not just a wild speculation or a guess, like it's my theory that the Cubs have a good chance next year, which is a really bad hypothesis, not a theory. It's a, it's a group of... It's a group of uh, propositions meant to explain something about nature, and that's what Darwin proposed in 1859. I'll tell you the constituents of the theory of evolution in a minute. So evolution began life as a theory, really formally in 1858, when Darwin and Wallace first wrote about it. And what happens is that a theory, that one in 1858, begins to gradually attain facthood as more and more pieces of evidence come down in favor of it, and, more, and no evidence is found to refute it. Okay, so a theory becomes fact, evolution has become a fact, and I will maintain that you are perverse, or you're a moron, or you simply can't understand the nature of evidence, or you're so blinded by religious considerations that you just reject all evidence, um, if you do not see that evolution is true. Okay, that's my um, fulmination for the moment. Now on to the positive stuff, the evidence for evolution. Okay, first we have to know what the theory of evolution is, and if you ask somebody, um, an average educated person, what the theory of evolution is, they won't be able to answer. They'll just say things evolve. And that's one of the parts of evolution, but it's not all of it. There's actually what I call five constituents of the theory, some of which hang together, some of which are independent of one another, all of which have to be tested and verified if you're going to say that this package that we call the theory of evolution is true. Okay, what are they? First of all, evolution occurs. <laughs> Populations change over time, and by change I mean they change genetically. The genetic constituents of a population, the kind of DNA that is shared by members of that population, undergoes temporal change. Second of all, that change is not instantaneous, but gradual. It varies. I mean, evolution can occur on scales of 10 years or 100 years, and more likely thousands to millions of years, but it does not happen overnight, except in very rare cases. So we're not talking about an instantaneous genetic change that changes like the population of dinosaurs into a population of birds. That was once thought to be the way evolution occurred. We no longer think that that's true. So that's part two. Now remember, these are somewhat independent. You can verify that things evolve, but the fact that they evolve gradually, they don't have to. They can change overnight. Okay. Two independent propositions. Third, and this is my own area of expertise, species.